All right, hello everybody. Look, I'm at the beach, but I don't know how much of the ocean we'll get to see. But um, we're gonna read Evelyn Underhill. Uh, it's called Mysticism, the study of the nature and development of spiritual consciousness, right? So let's do that. It's such a it's such such an amazing book. Uh, it was written in 1910. That's why it's free for me to read for us. I was gonna just read it myself, but I always want to just I want everybody in the whole world to experience the goodness of things that that come my way. Um, that's one of the things I like doing is connecting people with like the best resources spiritually, right? And so, and psychologically, I'm a psychologist in my day job for the past 20 plus years. So I'm a doctor, Dr. Cheryl Meyer. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, welcome here. You can start at the playlist. I, I always recommend just start with this video. Trust that this one came to you for a reason. And then you can go back and um, we're on the mystic way right now. We're So we're in the second half of the book. We're in the 30 hours worth of videos. So you have 30 hours of videos you can catch up on. Don't let that overwhelm you. It's amazing. Amazing. We've read all that. Okay, and so I'm going to start right now. It, we're in this chapter called Introversion, Recollection and Quiet. And so uh, we were on the introversion part. Now we're in the recollection part. And it'll make sense to you. It always does. Like wherever we start, um, you know, parts of it don't make sense to, to lots of people. And parts of it will maybe the whole thing might to some people who are studied in this so just you know be present and that's my recommendation and like start start by starting you know don't worry about um what you don't understand oh a u2 song is coming to me we've been running away from what we don't understand it's all right it's all right it's all right spirit moves in mysterious ways right that's what we're talking about mystery mystic but it's the mystery that can be known you know we're talking about what can be known all right the beginning of the process of introversion uh, the first mechanical act in which the self turns round towards the inward path um, will not merely be the yielding to an instinct the indulgence of a natural taste for reverie it will be a voluntary and purposeful undertaking. So the beginning of, so we're talking about purposeful introversion, not just like, oh, I'm so shy and I don't want people to judge me. So I'm introverted. This is like, you know, uh, I mean, now I know, I know this beautiful introverted man and he brought so much presence. Um, it's, it's, I'm not talking about the guy that I interviewed, um, but he's, he's the same, but I mean, I wouldn't call him introverted. I don't need to talk about him because that, I want him to be able to live his own life. But I only had permission for the one video. You know, that's um, how to heal the masculine. That's the video I'm talking about. But but I was talking about this other man that I know that like had to be introverted because of bullying in childhood and school and stuff. And But he has so much depth. There's so much depth to this man. And so even if you are introverted by your nature, you know, if you don't keep following it with vanity's sake, you know, like because you're afraid people will, re will reject you, but, but embrace what you've learned from introversion. Well, she'll tell us more, right? I, I got my mic out so that I got my mic in my hand. I think that's a Beastie Boys song. Oh no, it's a Tribe Called Quest song. <laughs> Okay, hold on. I'm going to do this so that if I turn this around, sorry about the noise that's going to happen, right? That if that you guys can watch the ocean and the volume will still be here. It, it won't be out there when I turn my phone around. Um, I think I'll do so now. All right, let's see what they were, she was saying though, because... If you know, if you've been here before, you know, I don't want to spend a, a lot of time just setting up my camera, but, and I set it up beforehand, but somehow I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, so I always want to switch it. Let's see what you're seeing. Uh, I, you might be seeing this guy on the phone and the ocean behind him. Hopefully that's okay. He's, his back is to us. So, 
I don't want people on camera unless they want to be. Um. Oh, see that's I'm using him. Oh, here's he's moving, so it's fine. Oh, I'll, I'll block him anyway. I'm using this owl mirror that I found there. Okay. So, um, I think I found it in Turkey or Mexico. It doesn't matter. Uh, the beginning of the process of introversion, the first mechanical act in which the self turns round towards the inward path will not merely be the yielding to an instinct, the indulgence of a natural taste for reverie. It will be a voluntary and purposeful undertaking. You know, kind of like hermits who go um, into the, the cloister, the monastery, you know. I'm gonna, I, I, might, I might do this every now and again. It's, it's a great Rumi quote anyway. There is a voice that doesn't use words. Listen. If, if I see someone that looks like a kid, if I happen to be paying attention, then I'm going to block. Because... Anyway. Okay. Like conversion, it entails a break with the obvious, which must of necessity involve and affect the whole natural consciousness. So let me say that second part again. Will not merely be the yielding to an instinct, the indulgence of a natural taste for reverie. It will be a voluntary and purposeful undertaking. Like conversion, you know, when you convert to Christianity or religion, it entails a break with the obvious, which must of necessity involve and affect the whole normal consciousness. It will be evoked by the mystic's love and directed by his reason, but can only be accomplished by the strenuous exercise of his will. So it's going to take discipline. I was just listening to the imitation of Christ, Thomas A. Kempis, and he was talking about that, like embrace discipline, embrace it. Leave, he was talking about, uh, act as if always you are a stranger to this world. So the affairs of this world mean nothing to you um, in a detached kind of way, but not like where you're insensitive to someone who's right in front of you, who's, you know, suffering. But even with them, if you have a deeper knowing that you're practiced in knowing in faith, that we have a higher purpose and a higher calling here, then you won't get pulled into, we, we call it the non-anxious presence in this, in this group that I'm in that uh, studies this, how to be present. It's, it's a Christian group, but I welcome all religions. You know, we're all just studying mysticism here. Anyway, and, and who knows, lots of people can call themselves a Christian group and it has nothing to do with Christ. So I don't even like saying the name oftentimes. Um, I mean, just anyway, I'll, I'll keep going. It will be evoked by the mystic's love and directed by his reason, his or her, but can only be accomplished by the strenuous exercise of his will. These preparatory labors of the contemplative life, these first steps upon the ladder are, says St. Teresa, St. Teresa of Avila, very hard and require greater courage than all the rest. Oh, wow, the first steps are. And, and Thomas A. Kempis was just saying the same thing I was reading when I was walking on the beach. He was saying that um, uh, when you stay in your room, you know, if you're a hermit, it's the room. For me, I was thinking of just going to one boring mass. I call it boring mass after another because at first to your flesh, to your senses, it seems really boring. But he says, if you stay in your room and stay past that part, you know, the part where it's just like, seems like the most boring thing in the world, then you'll just, it will, you'll treasure it and it will be sweet to you and, and feed your soul. And that's what happens. It's so amazing. Um, you just always want to be there. You know, you always want to be in silent. You're, you have, you develop a different taste where you don't want to hear the noisy gossip and chatter in the world, you know? All the scattered interests of the self have here to be collected. There must be a deliberate and unnatural act of attention, a deliberate expelling of all discordant images from the consciousness, a hard and ungrateful task. Since at this point, the transcendental faculties are still young and weak, the senses are not wholly mortified. It needs a stern determination, 
a, quote, willful choice if we are to succeed in concentrating our attention upon the whispered messages from within, undistracted by the loud voices which besiege us from without. How, says the disciple to the master in one of Bohem's uh, dialogues, you know, Jacob Bohem. Oh, hold on. Um, I'm just going to do this sometimes when people go by. Even though that guy's in glasses you had, you can't recognize. How, says the disciple to the master in one of Bohem's dialogues, am I to seek in the center of this fountain of light, which may enlighten me throughout and bring my properties into perfect harmony? I am in nature, as I said before, and which way shall I pass through nature and the light thereof, so that I may come into the supernatural and supersensual ground whence this true light, which is the light of minds, doth arise, and this without the destruction of my nature or quenching the light of it, which is my reason. Okay, and so I might read that again. Um, How, says the disciple to the master, in, in the master's capital M, in, in one of Bohem's dialogues, am I to seek in the center this fountain of light which may enlighten me throughout and bring my properties into perfect harmony? I am in nature, as I said before, and which way shall I pass through nature and the light thereof, so that I may come into the supernatural and supersensual ground whence this true light, which is the light of minds, doth arise? And this without the destruction of my nature or quenching the light of it, which is my reason. Okay, that's a long question. What I'm sensing from it is like St. John of the Cross says it, and I don't know if we talked about it. We might have talked about it in another video, but it's worth bringing up again. It was like so profound to me when it came to me is this idea of if there's a, if there's a, let me just turn you back around facing me. If there's a person that's fishing, right? Let's say you're the fish and it's like you want to know mystically the light of the sun, um, but this other light that they shine in to catch the fish blocks you from the light of the sun. And that's what St. John of the Cross, it was so helpful to understand. I hope I never ever forget, you know, even in the moment we don't want to forget because it's like, um, It's like we have the light of our senses. You know, we might want something in this world. And because we're looking at that, that light blocks us from the deeper light of the love of God that would just overwhelm us and make us feel like fully loved and fully valuable and fully known and everything fully that we ever wanted fully you know fully satiated in god in god's godness i call it that sometimes divine loves divine love and and so we think we're never going to know that because we don't know that yet you know we had just the the paltry and i'm not blaming our parents just experience in childhood of sometimes love intermittent love you know and glimpses of love and just always longing for more. And so we think we got to just hold on to this high, you know, we use that phrase, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Like, um, we use it in the, in the wrong way because we think I better keep holding on to this for dear life when really, you know, whoever loses his life will gain it. And the one who gains his life will lose it. Well, if you gain it in this world, you'll lose your real life, your soul life, right? understand that so that's what she, he's talking about okay but she goes on so good so we'll understand more master cease but from thine own activity steadfastly fixing thine eye upon one point ellipsis for this end gather in all thy thoughts and by faith press into the center laying hold upon the word of god which is infallible and which hath called thee be thou obedient to this call, and be silent before the Lord, sitting alone with him in thy inmost and most hidden cell. Oh, like the cell that Thomas A. Kempis was talking about. Okay, but it, in thy inmost and most hidden cell, thy mind 
being centrally united in itself and attending his will in the patience of hope, so shall thy light break forth as the morning, and after the redness thereof is past, the sun himself, which thou waitest for, shall arise unto thee, and under his most healing wings thou shalt greatly rejoice, ascending and descending in his bright and health-giving beams. Behold, this is the true supersensual ground of life. That's so awesome. I have, I do, I have my notebook here where I was getting a vision and, and don't be worried about not getting visions. Like um, someone, you know, if you put, put your ego in, into them, uh, my visions are just my own, un, it's just me reading the scriptures, let's say, and then trying to understand it. And my heart's just translating it to me or the Holy Spirit with my heart. I'm not saying there are these giant visions, you know, and like, it's not about bragging about that. It's, but, um, no, not at all. But what, let me see. Cause she just quoted, well, she quoted Bohem who was quoting, well, if I can't find it, I'm not going to, but it was Psalm 91. Okay. So Psalm 91 says, you know, um, I am protected under the shadow of the Almighty, the Almighty God. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Oh yeah, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, because I know a song that does it, um, shall abide under the shadow of his, it's, it's basically of his wings, okay? And so it's like she just talked about that. Um, so it, can't, it just it feels like it was just yesterday but anyway I did a video about it you can watch the video um, oh here here good I got it for us right um, let me take out this other stuff okay it was so cool because she just said so shall thy light break forth as the morning after the redness thereof passes and the sun will wait for you, you know, which thou waitest for shall arise unto thee and under his most healing wings thou shalt greatly rejoice, right? And so this is, this is um, how when you keep dwelling on like the oneness of God, you can see this, you know, whoever dwelleth under the defense of the most high, like back to the oneness, um, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It just keeps bringing me here. And then I drew this mountain like his wings. And we're underneath here where I will say unto the Lord, which is the I am, the word for the I am, which is the self-existent one, which is up here as well. I will say unto the Lord, um, thou art my hope and my stronghold in my God, in him will I trust. And so for he shall deliver me from the snare of the hunter and the noise and pestilence, you know, on this side and that side and the duality of what we experience. And he shall defend me, thee, he shall defend thee, us, you know, under his wings, right? This is where it goes under his wings. And so I just kept seeing it like we're here. And the more we keep going up to here, like she's talking about, the sun will rise in us. The more we stop going out to our outer senses. And I, I have it in this ring too. I wear this ring to remind myself what she said here. Be obedient to this call and be silent before the Lord, sitting alone with him in thy inmost and most hidden cell, thy mind being centrally united in itself. Jesus said, I think it's in Matthew 6, you know where it's, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. He says, when you pray, go into your inner room and shut the door and speak to God there. And there he will hear you secretly and reward you. It's, the word is manifestly, so it's, he will manifest this reward to you. And it could be in what she's talking about, well, you're, where you will start experiencing this bright sun within you. The, the, it, burn, it starts burning away these other parts of you that were, were ruling you and are me not meant to rule you, you know, like our vices and stuff like that. And so it does manifest. It might not manifest in like a Ferrari. There's probably a Ferrari in this parking lot. I'm, I'm by this awesome beach, obviously. Well, I mean, you can tell it's it's awesome because we come here so often. But yeah, the Ritz Carlton is the hotel right over there. Oh, I guess, shoot. I don't want to, ident I never want to identify where I am. Um, Northern California. No. Anyway, um, 
I, I don't like identifying because, uh, I mean, uh, you're welcome here. I identify it to locals, who, like people that, anyway, I, I'll just stop going on. Um, anyway. Uh, okay, so, here, so, uh, his most healing wings, you see, okay, and so, yes, if you're under the healing, I'll stop messing with this setting, if you're under the healing of God, right, of divine love, it's not just like, he holds me under his wings, it's like, philosophically, I start learning how to live in this way, where I'm, I'm back in the oneness, and I see duality as just the wings of God protecting me, instead of, I see, um, I see duality, like I, I mean, I keep going back into the oneness, and so that informs me in this life, and living that way protects me in this life, because I'm less caught up in the duality, you know, it's like uh, we have the love of God on one side, and we have people mocking that, and ha experiencing the absence of God on the other side, but it's still God created, God is, and this person is just revealing the sadness of 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 not knowing this love I, I was just contemplating that anyway I don't, have to, I don't have to do all teaching in this I'll let her teach um but I hope that helped inform you some um what we're talking about behold this is the true super sensual ground of life this is the dialogues of the super sensual life from Bohem that's the end of the quote, though. In this short paragraph, Bohem has caught and described the psychological state in which all introversion must begin. You know, this, going into your inner room introversion, right? And shut the door to the outer world. Sometimes when Jesus would heal someone, he would bring them away from the crowd, you know? Or he would just go into the room where the daughter had died and bring the mother and the father and James and John, you know? Not all the disciples could go up there. In this short paragraph, okay, so he's caught and described the psychological state in which all introversion must begin. The primary simplification of consciousness, the steadfast fixing of the soul's eye upon one point. Even when Christ was facing the cross, it said he, he, he his eyes were like flint. I have set my eyes like flint. And with the Isaiah passage describing the crucifixion, Isaiah 55, I think set the soul's eye upon one point the turning inwards of the whole connotate connotative powers for a purpose rather believed believed in than known you don't know it yet by faith pressing into the center so that's a quote by faith pressing into the center the unfortunate word recollection which the hasty reader is apt to connect with remembrance is their traditional term by which the mystical writers define just such a voluntary concentration, such a first collecting or gathering in of the attention of the self to its most hidden self. So you're not recalling like recollection, like remembering, you're recollecting. Like I was just hearing Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again, you know? There's all these pieces of yourself. As someone um, last night that I was sp speaking to called it, he was a priest, he's a priest, but he was talking, it's called a persona, these fragmented personas. When you don't forgive someone, he says, it's a fragmented, frozen persona of that person, and you're only seeing that frozen, fragmented part that's not even their real essence. And, and it stops the flow of love. That's, that's my translation after that part. And so what we're doing is we're recollecting ourselves and going back into, some people call it like your baptized self, your soul self, your higher self, your essence self, you who, who is you before you had a name, you know? The beingness of you that... God shared Godness with you because you're both divine and have this human body. You know, C.S. Lewis says we would be tempted to to worship each other if we saw each other in our spiritual forms. But I know also other mystics that have seen ugly animals. St. John of the Cross talks about it, like the reptiles of our actions and all these horrible things that surround that 
um, that so easily entangle us, let's say. Um, I want to recollect myself to be more centered here with you as I, as I read the rest of this chapter for us, right? So, um, where you gather yourself in of the attention of the self to its most hidden self, the gathering in of the attention of the self to its most hidden self. So you're not buying into the ebb and flow out there. You're, you're in a state of equanimity. You're a state of recalling yourself back in here to the inner, innermost chamber, you know, with God. The self is as yet unacquainted with the strange, changeless, and indescribable plane of silent, silent, which so soon becomes familiar to those who attempt even the lowest activities of the contemplative life. My friend Elliot Smith was a musician. He's passed away now, but um, he sang a song and it's like, why would you want any other when you're a world within a world? Can't make a sound. He's talking about this silent place. Um, yeah, the song's called Can't Make a Sound. I was trying to remember the name of the song so you could listen to it if you want. I made an hour teaching on it, but that's not public right now until I get the rights. Um, I'm like, I was going to cross my fingers, but it's just like, if you pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, say a prayer that I get the rights so that all these teachings can go out because I keep kept getting messages through songs and I'm so excited to bring them to the world I already have some that I have the rights to so you're welcome to go to those that's at um I'm not trying to use this to promote I'm just telling you if you want to know it's at because I don't want to leave you in curiosity uh www.yoursoulsongs.com your soul songs I did one of Elliot's songs because it was unreleased so it's not copyrighted I haven't uploaded that yet though I did that a week and a half ago I need to upload it um, all right. It will be by the time this goes up, I'm pretty sure. This self... Okay, so... So they're talking about the silence in, that you know of, even when you just do the beginning of this. Where the noises of this world are never heard, and the great adventures of the spirit take place. That's so awesome. Um, that self is as yet unacquainted with the strange, changeless, and indescribable plane of silence... Which, is so, which so soon becomes familiar to those who attempt even the lowest activities of the contemplative life, where the noises of the world are never heard and the great adventures of the spirit take place. It, it's a world within a world. And, and uh, Bob Marley saying the same thing. He said, man is a universe within himself. It, it stands here between two planes of being. The eye of time is still awake. It knows that it wants to enter the inner world, that interior palace where the king of kings is guest. But it must find some device to help it over the threshold, rather in the language of modern psychology, to shift that threshold and permit its subliminal intuition of the absolute to emerge. Here, I'll turn it back around for a little bit. There's a guy up in the sky or a woman on a motor in one of those things. I don't know, like a balloon thing. I don't know what it's called. I, I can't tell what you're seeing again, but I'll just, I want to stop interrupting this. This device has a rule, the practice of meditation in which the state of recollection usually begins, that is to say, the deliberate consideration of and dwelling upon some one aspect of reality, an aspect most usually chosen from amongst the religious beliefs of the self. Thus Hindu mystics will brood upon a sacred word, whilst Christian contemplatives set before their minds one of the names or attributes of God. A fragment of scripture, like the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's a fragment of a scripture. 
there's a book called The Way of the Pilgrim. And um, there's a lot of ascetic books that recommend doing that. Because, um, and John Butler, you can watch. I have lots of one minute clips of John Butler. I love him. He's done the Jesus prayer like that. He taught me it like that um, over video, you know, for 30 years now, I think he's done it. And he just, like, you can see the evidence of what it does in your life. You know, you're not doing it for that end, but it helps you detach from these constant thoughts that are just going and going and going that you, we do, we need, it's important to learn to let go of. But thus Hindu mystics will brood upon a sacred word whilst Christian contemplatives set before their minds one of the names or attributes of God, a fragment of scripture, an incident of the life of Christ, and allow, indeed encourage, excuse me, this consideration and the ideas and feelings which flow from it to occupy the whole mental field. This powerful suggestion, kept before the consciousness by an act of will, overpowers the stream of small suggestions which the outer world pours incessantly upon the mind. The self, concentrated upon this image or idea, dwelling on it more than thinking about it, as one may gaze upon a picture that one loves, falls gradually and insensibly into the condition of reverie, a recollected state, you know, and protected by this holy daydream from the more distracting dream of life, sinks into itself and becomes, in the language of asceticism, recollected or gathered together. Although it is deliberately ignoring the whole of its usual external universe, its faculties are wide awake all have had their part in the willful production of this state of consciousness, right? And this it is which marks off meditation and recollection from the higher or infused degrees of horizon. Such meditation as this, says Richard of St. Victor, is the activity proper to a mystic who has attained the first degree of ardent love. By it, quote, God enters into the mind, end quote, and the mind also enters into itself. That's awesome. And thus receives in its inmost cell, quote, first visit of the beloved, the first visit of the beloved, end quote. It is a kind of halfway house between the perception of appearance and the perception of reality. To one in whom this state is established, consciousness seems like a blank field, save for the one point in its center, like this the subject of the meditation. Towards this focus, the introversive self seems to press inwards from every side, still faintly conscious of the buzz of the external world outside its ramparts, but refusing to respond to its appeals. That's so strange, because I was like, maybe I ought not to turn my camera around when that person's in the air, because who cares? You know, who cares what we're, what we're looking at? If it's me, if it's the ocean, if it's if it's the roof of my car, you know, just be present. Presently, the subject of meditation begins to take on a new significance, a glow with life and light. The contemplative suddenly feels that he knows it in the complete vital but indescribable way in which one knows a friend. Ah, where you can't, like what I was talking about my friends earlier, you know, you can't describe the essence of these two, these two men that I'm talking about unless you met them and, and knew a bit about them. You can, you know, if you watch the Healing the Masculine, because that, that's like an hour and 20 minutes. You get a, a taste, you get a sense of, of how my friend is, you know. Um, but it's like that. And so you, you enter into this quiet state where it's just like, oh, I see, when I go up here, everything in life makes sense and when I'm holding on to this the one divine love God then I don't care what happens here you know I'm not I'm not worried about what happens because I have God you know um Kierkegaard said that you know he's like if it's true that you know those who lose the whole world how much better Jesus said it's better to lose the whole world and gain your soul right and Kierkegaard was saying like and what have you lost 
you've lost nothing if you gain your soul and you lose the world you know but you know that when you're in this meditative state you know what you taste it more and more taste and see that the lord is good feed on this you know you're not like you're not someone said it the other day this way they said it's not about convincing yourself it's about experiencing this and then you know you know and so much of the time we try to convince ourselves god is good god is good jesus loves you jesus loves you you know whatever you know and uh, i'm not saying don't tell yourself that but because all these doubts can assail you even if you've had lots of experiences like this presently the subject of meditation begins to take on a new significance to glow with life and light the contemplative suddenly feels that he knows it in the complete vital but indescribable way in which one knows a friend more that through it hints are coming to him of mightier nameless things it ceases to be a picture and becomes a window through which by straining all his faculties, the mystic peers out into the spiritual universe and apprehends to some extent, though how he knows not, the veritable presence of God. In these meditative and recollective states, the self still, still feels very clearly the edge of its own personality, its separateness from the somewhat other, with a capital S and O, you know, somewhat other, the God, the divine reality set over and against the soul. It is aware of that reality. The subject of its meditation becomes a symbol through which it receives a distinct message from the transcendental world. But there is yet no conscious fusion with a greater life, no resting in the divine atmosphere as in the quiet, no involuntary and ecstatic lifting up of the soul to direct apprehension of truth as in contemplation. Recollection is a perfectly definite psychic condition in which, uh, which has perfectly logical psychic results you know, in your psyche. Right? Originally induced by meditation or the dreamy pondering upon certain aspects of the real, with a capital R, it develops by way of the strenuous control exercised by the will over the understanding, a power of cutting the connection between the self and the external world and retreating at will to the inner world of the spirit. True recollection, says St. Teresa, has characteristics by which it can be easily recognized. It produces a certain effect which I do not know how to explain, but which is well understood by those who have experienced it. Ellipsis. It is true that recollection has several degrees and that in the beginning those great effects are not felt because it is not yet profound enough. But support the pains which you first feel in recollecting yourself, despite the rebellion of nature, you know, of your senses. Your flesh will be like, ah, you know overcome the resistance of the body which loves the liberty which is its ruin learn self-conquest i want to just keep repeating that for the rest of our time learn self-conquest because thomas a Kempis was talking about that so much in the imitation of christ you know persevere thus for a time and you will perceive very clearly the advantages which you gain from it as soon as you apply yourself to a horizon you will at once feel your senses gather themselves together they seem like bees which return to the hive and there shut themselves up to work at the making of honey and this will take place without effort or care on your part god thus rewards the violence which your soul has been doing to itself and gives to it such a domination over the senses that a sign is enough when it desires to recollect itself, for them to obey and so gather themselves together. At the first call of the will, they come back more and more quickly. At last, after many and many exercises of this kind, God disposes them to a state of absolute repose and of perfect contemplation." End quote. Maybe it, that's what it means when it says, you know, it, the kingdom of heaven is, is taken by violence. You know, you have to do violence. Uh, you know, not, not like whip yourself, but like your flesh will cry out and be like, no, you know, I want it. I want food. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I need to do this. Like I've ha anyway, I won't go into uh, the experiences that I've had, but I'm sure you have as well. And just persevere through. It's worth it. It's just like, 
you know, after having, you know, being pregnant for nine and a half months, you know, you're going to, you're just going to persevere through, I've done that too, through giving birth. It, it's, oh, I'm thinking of the verse, though he slay me, yet, yet will I trust in him. It feels like you're going to die. A lot of these things feel like you're actually going to die. Even when you leave your mother and father and come and follow Christ, it feels like we're going to die because we learned to acquiesce to our parents and please them and if we do something that's different that God is calling us to a higher consciousness and a higher love than our parents did it feels like we're going to die because it feels like we're going to upset our parents and they're going to reject us and they're going to cut us off and then we're not going to have food you know and we're going to die from starvation because it was so ingrained in us to please them as children you know please them or rebel them rebel from them if you are rebelling you're still in reaction to those parents you haven't you haven't achieved true liberty true liberty is to be able to say yes or to, or no no is just a reaction to you know this feeling of being controlled all the time it's not discipline anyway such a description as this makes it clear that recollection is a form of spiritual gymnastics less valuable for itself than for the training which it gives the powers which it develops in it says saint Teresa again the soul enters with its god into that paradise which is within itself paradise oh. paradise i've got lots of songs with the word paradise in them um but this is the true one it's just like eden we were in paradise before they fell away into separation which is a kind of death from God, you know. Um, that paradise which is within itself and shuts the door behind it upon all the things of this world. Quote, you should know, my daughters, she continues, St. Teresa of Avila does, that, quote, this is no supernatural act, but depends upon our will, and that, therefore, we can do it with that ordinary assistance of God, which we need for all our acts and even for our good thoughts. For here we are not concerned with the silence of the faculties, but with a simple retreat of these powers into the ground of the soul. There are various ways of arriving at it, and these ways are described in different books. There it is said that we must abstract the mind from exterior things in order that we may inwardly approach God, that even in our work, we ought to retire within ourselves, though it be only for a moment that this remembrance of a God who companions us within is a great help to us. Finally, that we ought little by little to habituate ourselves to gentle and silent converse with him so that he may make us feel his presence in the soul. The sun's not setting yet, but it's behind all those clouds over there. About two videos ago, I think, or maybe three, or maybe one, <laughs> I don't remember when. Uh, I think more than one. Um, yeah, it was two videos ag ago. She did this exercise. She had us do this exercise in the book where we practiced being quiet and just stared at something. So we stared at whatever was the ocean or the tree or whatever you, whatever you chose so that you could have a miniature practice of this. All right. Now we're going into the section called quiet. More important for us, because more characteristically mystical, is the next great stage of horizon, that curious and extremely definite mental state which mystics call the interior silence or horizon of quiet. That's like uh, Elliot singing, can't make a sound, you know. This represents the results for consciousness of a further degree of that inward retreat in which recollection began. Out of the deep, slow brooding and pondering on some mystery, some incomprehensible link between himself and the real, with a capital R, the contemplative, perhaps by way of a series of moods, 
which his analytic powers may cause him nicely to distinguish, glides almost insensibly on to a plane of perception for which human speech has few equivalents. It is a plane which is apparently characterized by an immense increase in the receptivity of the soul, and by an almost complete suspension of the reflective powers. The strange silence, which is the outstanding quality of this state, almost the only note in regard to it which the surface intelligence can secure, is not describable. Here, as Samuel Rutherford, Rutherford said of another of life's secrets, come and see will tell you much. Come nearer will say more. Oh, that's beautiful. Here the self has passed beyond the stage at which its perceptions are capable of being dealt with by thought. It cannot any longer take notes, can only surrender itself to the stream of an inflowing life and to the direction of a larger will. Actually, there's a video out there. I'm just checking if I can, if I'm, if I ought to tell you. Okay, it's called Wide Angle Vision, and I think it's from at least 10 years ago. And I learned it from the actual person who taught this, and this guy is just teaching the same thing. But when you relax your eyes, right, as if you're looking at this whole horizon at once. This is just this passage in the book reminded me of it. Um, the Native Americans, I learned it from a man who learned it from a Native American, said and I'm part Native American, said we usually look at the world in little tunnel vision like this. Click, click, click. We take pictures. And so the Native Americans could hide in plain sight because they knew where your eye would go and that you wouldn't just see them laying on the ground in this one area, like maybe with paint or whatever, but, you know, um, with camouflage on, but still you wouldn't see them where, if you, will, if you were looking with wide angle vision, you'd see. But when you relax your eyes, if, I'm, if I have like a stop sign in front of me, I can tell that it's the shape of a stop sign, but my eyes are relaxed and it takes you into alpha brain waves. I'm telling you the whole video right now. And um, after about five minutes, you're in alpha brain waves and you can see the stop sign in front of you, but you can't read it. And so it's kind of like that. that. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I don't always recommend just messing with your brain waves. Um, But when you practice this kind of meditation, you notice that you're sort of in that brain state anyway. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> I, I don't want to lead people off the path. So I'm very cautious usually about what I say now these days. Um, come and see will tell you much. Come nearer will say more. You're coming nearer. You're going into your soul self. Well, your yourself in God. It's Jesus says. Um, Jesus says it this way. I mean, you enter this mystery that he says is like. For you have died with Christ. Well, Paul says that you have died with Christ, and you are hidden with Christ in God. But he says, "I am with you." Jesus said, "I am with you, and you are with me," and, and that in heaven we're with God in heaven somehow. Where we're with Christ, hidden in God, with Christ, hidden with Christ in God in heaven in the heavenly places right now and we're experiencing earth and mass when people do a mass a serious you know a real one given by real ordained priests that go can trace back to saint peter or whatever then they believe that they are entering into the heavenly realms that's why a mass can be one of these mystic contemplative places because they're entering into the heavenly realms and you're joining them with with them in this place but people don't know that. They just think, oh, that's a boring mass. You know what I mean? And they don't know. No, you're, you're train your flesh to get over the boring part and know that you have this opportunity to enter into the higher realms of God, of heaven, mystically. Anyway, here the self has passed beyond the stage at which its perceptions are capable of being dealt with by thought. That's why I was saying you can't see 
these letters anymore because you're in a wider angle of vision. That's just how, anyway. It cannot any longer take notes. It can only surrender itself into the stream of an inflowing life and to the direction of a larger will. Thy will be done on earth. We were made out of earth as it is in heaven, you know. Busy, teasing, utilitarian thought would only interfere with this process as it interferes with the vital process of the body if it once gets them under its control. Like if I try to think about breathe, breathe, no, beat your heart. You know what I mean? You can't like stop those thoughts, you know. Like we can't do these. We can do them sometimes, but you know, anyway. That thought then already disciplined by the rec- by recollection, recollection gathered up and forced to work in the interest of the transcendental mind is now to be entirely inhibited. As recollection becomes deeper, the self slides into a dreamy consciousness of the infinite. Wow. I just heard it like in my inner mind, an Oasis song. Slip inside the eye of your mind. I, I sang it off, but... And together you might find something. Da, 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 da. I've listened to that song a lot, and it's talking about this. Um, so Sally can wait. It's like, don't look back in anger, I heard you say. Um, so my soul slides away. <laughs> soul slides away. Anyway, um, if Liam and what's his name, Chris Gallagher, if they come by these videos, like, forgive me if I quoted the lyrics wrong. Um, but I love that song. I love it. Anyway, it's by Oasis. As recollection becomes deeper and the self slides into slip inside the uh, he's talking about sliding and then slides my soul slides away it's like that slides into a dreamy consciousness of the infinite the door tight shut on the sensual world it becomes aware that it is immersed in a more real world which it cannot define it rests quietly in this awareness quiet silent utterly at peace in the place of the struggles for complete concentration which mark the beginning of recollection. There is now an entire surrender of the will and activity of the very power of choice. And with this surrender to something bigger, as with the surrender of conversion, comes an immense relief of strain. You're like, oh yes, or you just... This is quiet in its most perfect form. This sinking, as it were, of the little child of the infinite into its father's arms. Mm. There's a psalm that says that. There's this guy, not John Michael, Michael Talbot, Talbot, that sings a song, Come to the Quiet, that's based on a psalm. Um, my soul at rest in its daddy's arms. I have stilled my soul completely. Come to the quiet, come and still your soul. Like a child at rest in its daddy's arms, I have stilled my soul completely. That's what she's talking about. And that's what King David was talking about in the psalm. Because it's a song. When you enter into art and into art forms and song and poetry, you go into this and the mystic experience at church, you know, and at religious places. You, like Sufi dancers, you go into the heavenly realms. Pavel Florensky has a beautiful quote about that. About entering into the heavenly realms. I quote it all the time. It's where all of your soul songs come from but the artists that's why i quote music so often too because they do tap into that realm whether they know it or not but um you can go into this quiet your quiet of surrender of like oh i'm in my loving daddy's arms you know the giving up of i hood you know when mary mary says to, to gabriel be it unto me according to to god's god's will be it unto me according to his will. Let it be so unto me. Uh, and I really think that, I know the Beatles act like they weren't quoting this because they didn't want to get under religious people attacking them. But when they said, you know, whisper, 
Mother Mary comes to me. I know Paul had a Mother Mary that passed away or whatever, but or John Lennon did, but it was like, Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. Let it be unto me according to thy will. Like, listen to that song a different way, and it's profound. Whether the Beatles even knew they were tapping into that, I'm sure they did. I, I think um, John and Paul were both I'm like the original Paul. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know if I'm kidding or not, but um, that's a long story. Uh, uh, we're baptized Anglican, I think. So they were both baptized, either Catholic or Anglican, but they were baptized as children, if you understand what that sacrament means. Um, the giving up of, I mean, we can all fall away from that, but like, I pray to God not. The, the giving up of eyehood, the process of self-stripping, which we have seen to be the very essence of the purification of the self. There's a whole chapter on the purification of the self. Finds in its correspondence in this part of the contemplative experience. Here in this complete cessation of man's proud effort to do somewhat of himself, humility who rules the fourth degree of love begins to be known in her paradoxical beauty and power. Consciousness here lo loses to find and dies that it may live. Oh, just like we were talking about. No longer in Roll's pungent phrase is it a ransacker of the might of God and of his majesty. Um, it's, it's written in Old English, so that's why I was like... Uh, Thus, the act by which it passes into the quiet is a sacrament of the whole mystic quest, of the turning from doing to being. You know, like Mary sat at Jesus' feet, and Martha was doing, and Mary was being. There is the cutest little girl out there. Oh my gosh, she's like maybe 13 months, because she's just walking so cute. I can't show you though because I want to protect kids. Oh my gosh. She's walking right up to my car. Well, to the car next to me. Um, I just waved at the daddy. So cute. I, I would almost show you the back of her. Her dad's holding her hand. She's got like, um, like MC Hammer pants. You know what I mean? They're like baggy. <laughs> I call them like European pants. <laughs> like they wear them. Maybe they're from Europe. Okay. The, not to be distracted from outside, but like little kids can... We were just talking about a child at rest and it's daddy's arms. I'll show you the daddy. Just so you see. Oh my gosh. I didn't even get it. I didn't even connect that we just saw a child like walking in his daddy's arms. Like learning how to walk. I saw it and I got to tell you and then I just showed you the box. Now he just picked her up. God is so sweet. <laughs> like I'm sorry I can't show you more of that because I don't I'm just so protective of kids. <laughs> Maybe to a fault, but whatever, I'd rather be on that fault. Um Okay, so we're almost finished, right? Because we're almost at the end of our time. I try to stay within about an hour so people can set aside an hour or half an hour if you watch this at two times speed. My friend's like, I would never speed you up, you know, my friend. I won't say her name. Here in this complete cessation of man's proud effort to do something of himself, humility, who rules the fourth degree of love, begins to be known in her paradoxical beauty and power. Consciousness here loses loses to find and dies that it may live. No longer in Roll's pungent phrase is it a ransacker of the might of God and of his majesty. Thus, the act by which it passes into the quiet is a sacrament of the whole mystic quest, of the turning from doing to being, the abolition of separateness in the interest of the absolute life, with a capital A, right? The state of quiet, we have said, entails an utter suspension of the surface consciousness, yet consciousness of the subject's personality remains. Hold on, I was just saying a prayer. The state of quiet, we have said, entails an utter suspension of the surface consciousness, yet consciousness of the subject's personality remains. 
It follows generally on a period of deliberate and loving recollection of a slow and steady withdrawal of the attention from the channels of sense. To one who is entering into this state of horizon, the external world seems to get further and further away till at last nothing but the paramount fact of his own existence remains. If you study Dr. Joe Dispenza, he's like, in space. I went to a week-long advanced training. And it's, it was intense. He did a five-hour meditation. I have a video called After My Five-Hour Meditation with Joe Dispenza or something like that. Um, but he's just like, no mind. <laughs> he, he's trying to teach you how to enter into these states so that you'll stop being programmed by your egotism, your outer mind. Um, but, you know, I always say to what end? To what end, you know? If we're doing that just so we have a better life here, then then that's ridiculous. <laughs> According to like, you know, what I was just reading in the Imitation of Christ, why why do that? You know, who cares to have a better life here? But you're gonna have a better life here when you're detached from this world and you're one with God, right? Anyway, but that's for you. That's for you to choose. Like, I'm not gonna make that choice for you. It's not for me to convince you. Okay, till it lasts, nothing. But the paramount fact of his own existence remains. So startling very often is the deprivation of all his accustomed mental furniture, of the noise and flashing of the transmitting instruments of sense, that the negative aspect, you know, like the, the, it's like if you look at the shadow and the light, like this, this shadow, the negative, the absence of all of this, you know, chatter, 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 the negative aspect of his state dominates consciousness and he can but describe it as nothingness and emptiness and naked horizon he is there as it were poised resting waiting he does not know for what only he is conscious that that all even in this utter emptiness is well all is well like saint julian of norwich found presently however he becomes aware that something fills this emptiness Something omnipresent, intangible, like sunny air. Ah, John Butler said, grace is like spiritual sunshine, right? Sunny air. Ceasing to attend to the messages from without, he begins to notice that which has always been within. His whole being is thrown open to its influence. It permeates his consciousness. There are then two aspects of the horizon of quiet, the aspect of deprivation of emptiness, which begins it, and the aspect of acquisition of something found in which it is complete. In its description, all mystics will be found to lean on to one side or the other, to the affirmative or negative element which it contains. The austere mysticism of Eckhart, Meister Eckhart, right? Which um, Eckhart totally took his name from. And his followers, Meister Eckhart, um, their temperamental sympathy with the Neoplatonic language of Dionysius, the Areopagite, caused them to describe it, and also very often the higher state of contemplation to which it leads as above all things, an emptiness, a sublime dark, an ecstatic deprivation. They will not profane its deep satisfactions by the inadequate terms proper to earthly peace and joy. You know, people go, oh, a state of peace. There's a mommy with her little son he looks about two he's toddling along i'll leave them be all right because i'm anyway um they will not profane its deep satisfaction by the inadequate terms proper to earthly peace and joy and true to their school fall back on the paradoxically suggestive powers of negation to saint Teresa and mystics of her type on the other hand even a little and inadequate image of its rapture seems, seems better than none To them, it is a sweet calm, a gentle silence in which the lover apprehends the presence of the beloved, a God-given state, you know, by grace, over which the self has little control. In Eckhart's writings, enthusiastic description of the quiet, of inward silence and passivity as the fruit of a deliberate recollection abound. In his view, This psychical state of quiet is preeminently that in which the soul of man begins to be united with its ground, pure being, with capital P and B, pure being. The emptying of the field of consciousness, its cleansing of all images, even of those symbols of reality, 
which are the subjects of meditation, is the necessary condition under which alone this encounter can take place. The soul, he says, with all its powers, has divided and scattered itself in outward things, each according to its functions, the power of sight in the eye, the power of hearing in the ear, the power of taste in the tongue, and thus, thus they are the less able to work inwardly, for every power which is divided is imperfect. So the soul, if she would work, I'm going to and finish this quote, if she would work inwardly, must call home all her powers and collect them from all divided things to one inward work. Ellipsis. If a man will work an inward work, he must pour all his powers into himself as into a corner of the soul and must hide himself from all images and forms. And then he can work. Then he must come into forgetting and a not knowing. He must be in a stillness and silence where the word, capital W word, you know, may be heard. Jesus was called the word, you know, the logos. One cannot draw near this word with a capital W better than by stillness and silence. Then it is heard and understood in utter ignorance. When one knows nothing, it is opened and revealed. Then we shall become aware of the divine ignorance and our ignorance will be ennobled and adorned with supernatural knowledge. And when we simply keep ourselves receptive, we are more perfect than when, when at work. All right. So St. John of the Cross says it that way. He says in order to know something you must go on the path where you know nothing you must seek to want nothing and know nothing and then in this void he describes this is in the ascent of mount carmel that um, god enters into that and so he quotes saint david saying i mean king david saying i am poor even though he was a king i won't talk more about it i wish you so much love thank you for being here i honor your presence I'd appreciate it if you subscribe if you're here. If you made it all the way to this part, subscribe. You definitely will be into the stuff that I share if you made it this far. And um, uh, like and share to like-minded, you know, and comment. Because when you comment, it YouTube pushes videos out more if there's more comments. And so do your favorite quote or your uh, favorite music lyric I don't care just I think it it ought to be six words or more or something is what trips their algorithm you know if you'd like to then you're participating in bringing this to more people that's what you're choosing to do all right much love